August Fennerstrom helps the Polson family. As the boat starts breaking apart, Alma hands him a little pistol. It must have been hell to pay for the last 15 minutes of their lives. Totally chaotic with all the people running around screaming and, and obviously by the time they actually realized that the boat was going under and uh, she had four kids, she only had two arms. There were no lifeboats left when she uh, reached the boat deck. And so where should she go? Nowhere. There were nowhere to go. Alma was remembered by survivors to have played the harmonica on board. In those last moments, she may have tried to calm her frightened children with music. They were faced with the same kind of thing that someone on an airplane faces when it is just about to go down. Their fate was sealed, and Alma would have realized at that point that she and her children were about to die. At 2.10, the violent breakup of the ship drew terrified passengers into the ocean. Eusta was torn from August Fennerstrom's arms. And though the man made it to a lifeboat, the little boy was lost. Nearly a week later, the first Canadian recovery team was overwhelmed by the number of bodies they found floating amongst the wreckage. Up on the deck of the Mackie Bennett, team assembled to handle the grim task of processing the remains of each victim. As each body was brought on board, it was given a number, and a record was made of the individual's sex, approximate age, height, weight, and hair color. They also searched each victim for identifying clues, anything to reveal their nationality, and hopefully, their name. A third-class ticket identified the body of Alma Folsom, listed with her four children. She was the 206th body found by the men of the Mackie Bennett. On her finger was a wedding ring, and in her coat, the men found a letter from husband Niels. They also found Alma's harmonica. All personal effects were cataloged and carefully stored in canvas bags, marked with a body number. John Snow, Jr., undertaker on board the Mackie Bennett, had the overwhelming task of processing the dead. A lack of time and supplies made it impossible to embalm every victim. The bodies were prepared according to class. If they were identified clearly as first-class passengers, you went into a wooden coffin, and they were piled on the rear of the Mackie Bennett. If you were third class or crew, you probably didn't get that. You were put in canvas at the forward deck, but they ran out of canvas. So they had to then start burying bodies on a regular process for the first three or four evenings. Every evening they were burying bodies. They seemed to bury three at a time. The battered or decomposing corpses were given a burial at sea. For as much as it had pleased Almighty God to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the deep. Three other ships joined the Mackie Bennett. They combed the seas for more than a month, recovered 328 bodies. Night after night, the funerals continued until 119 souls had been buried at sea, 60 without names. The remaining 209 victims were brought back to Halifax. For that period of time, Halifax was known as the City of Sorrow. The, the ship of death had brought the, the victims into Halifax, and the whole city was in mourning. The bells rang as the Mackie Bank came up the harbor. All flags were half staff. A local ice rink became a temporary morgue. The families of the victims could try and find their missing relatives. Post-mortem photographs were taken and sent to the White Star Line, but it is unlikely they were seen by relatives of third-class passengers. And the effort did little to help with the identification process. On May 3rd, just three days after the Mackie Bennett returned to Halifax, the first bodies were laid to rest. They actually dug a long trench and took the first 30 coffins and laid them in side by side to, in effect, have a mass burial. 
for no one arrived to claim the body of the only child brought back from the sea. The men of the Mackie Bennett stayed true to their word and organized an elaborate funeral. It was held in the Round Church, St. George's, and the men of the Mackie Bennett, the 75 crew members, were the ones that ran the service. A small white coffin piled high with flowers, special uh, procession to bring it out to a horse-drawn carriage, and then up uh, Brunswick Street to the north end of the city to the cemetery. This was a child uh, symbolic of all the children that was lost on the Titanic, perhaps, and the community turned out. May 18, 2001. After months of planning, comparative DNA is now in place from all of the relatives. The Titanic identification team is ready for the next big step, the exhumations. Graves 240 and 281, which they hope will contain the bodies of Charles Shorney and Catherine Wallace, lie side by side in Fairview Lawn Cemetery, at the bottom of a long slope. The team starts here with a backhoe. The trench is only four feet deep, but before the wooden coffins appear, the backhoe exposes something that could spell disaster for the project water. The graves are flooded. This is terrible news for two of the three families. We were hoping that we'd be able to find some skeletal remains because it turns out that bone is a very good archive for DNA and um, there just simply were no remains in 281 or 240. Sadly, Joan Allison, whose quest started the DNA project, now has little chance of finding her grandmother. I was pretty upset because I had hoped and prayed that there would be something, but unfortunately there wasn't. Though Charles Shorney's relatives have also come to a dead end on the DNA front, there is still one piece of evidence that could help them establish a link to the grave in Halifax post-mortem photo of body 240. Jillian and her siblings have never seen the image. In fact, they did not even know of its existence until Alan Ruffman brought it to their attention. They study it closely, yes. hoping to see a resemblance to their Uncle Charles. The general shape of the face could you well be... You see the way the chin protrudes there. Yes, it does. In exactly the same way there. That's right. And it's a very similar type of nose, as far as one can tell. Yes. This could be Charlie, but I couldn't swear I to think it. it's more a probability than a possibility. I think it's very sad. It is very sad. It's, mm -hmm. it's something I quite dreaded seeing the first time mm -hmm. I saw it, because that's somebody's son, whether it's, it's ours or not. And somebody lost that lad. Another photograph in the Shorney family archive reinforces Gillian, Amelda, and Hillary's convictions that Charles and Body 240 yes. might be the same man. When I was looking through photographs, this small photograph of young Austin, Charlie's half-brother, fell out of the others. And I looked at it and I thought, that is that boy in the coffin. I think this makes my feeling that Body 240 is Charlie Shorney. Much stronger, much more likely. Mm -hmm. I know we can't prove it exactly. Well, I think it's been proven as far as it's but possible to do so with what's available. That's amazing. It is. Forensic investigator Gerald Richards has seen families in this situation before and sympathizes with their need for an answer. Most families who want to identify an individual will see the characteristics that are similar, are the same, and they'll just kind of disregard the ones that don't look quite the same. They want closure. They want to be able to identify their loved ones and, and be able to know that they're at rest. Using techniques perfected by the FBI, Richards hopes to provide definitive proof. He compares the post-mortem photo with an image of Shawnee taken right before he died. Richard's experienced eye can pick up details the relatives may have missed. In looking at the eyebrows of the 240 body, 
they're fairly straight across, where Mr. Shorney's is much rounder, much more open, and actually goes right down into the top of his nose quite distinctly. Uh, body 240, the actual eyebrows stop well before the top ridge of the nose. The eyebrows don't match, but to be sure, Richards turns to a feature that never lies, the ear. On Mr. Shorney, there's actually no bottom portion of the lobe. It's pretty much connected directly into the cheekbone. On body 240, when we look at the lobe, we can see that it's much thicker here and actually has a curvature that comes up and back into the cheekbone, forming a, a flap of the lobe there all the way across. The distinct differences in the characteristics which I'm seeing right now as we're looking at the screen uh, pretty much indicate to me these are two different people. In, in my opinion, at this point, body 240 is not Mr. Shiny. Though the results of the photo analysis are hard to dispute, at the end of the day, for Charles Shorney's relatives, evidence is only one side of the story. I think my reaction when we heard that you had no conclusive evidence from the grave was that perhaps there was a little wry laughter in heaven, because they're all dead. They all know where they were. Though the graves of body 240 and 281 have come up empty, there is still one final body to exhume, and one last shot at an identification. At the top of a slope, the resting place of the unknown child escaped the worst of the flooding that destroyed the other two graves. Though remains are sparse, they do find three teeth and one tiny piece of bone. My take on this is, is that the unknown child is, um, is giving us a chance to identify him. Um, are we too late? Um, we don't know yet. The teeth and bone fragment now travel to Lakehead University to the lab of biological archaeologist Dr. L. Molto for analysis. Molto's extensive skeletal collection helps him recognize the fragment. I identified it as a tiny piece of bone from the right ulna, which is a bone in the forearm. And so this was the bona fide piece of human bone, the last piece of human bone that this little child had. It was almost like the child was crying out to be identified. It was as if fate had stepped in to provide one last chance for the unknown child to reclaim his name. As a final token of their commitment to the small boy they had recovered from the sea, the men of the Mackie Bennett commissioned a copper plaque with the words, Our Babe, to adorn the little white coffin. We think that the baby's arms might have been crossed, and so the, the plaque came to rest on the, on the right arm, and probably right near the proximal or upper end of the ulna. Copper ions from the plaque bonded with bone tissue and acted as a preservative. Without the memorial, the bone would have dissolved years ago. I'm not very religious, but from my perspective, that was a, a little sign. A sign that uh, we're going to do this, we're going to get the, the unknown child eventually identified. <laughs>